Hello fashionistas and welcome to Mastarhead, who's wearing what in the known world? Before you tune out thinking clothes are boring, if you're looking for immersion in your game world, clothing is a major part of it. Fashion is very much a thing and knowing how people look from nation to nation lets you define that region. What fabrics do they use? How differently do the elite dress from the peasants? What does it take to blend in and what's going to get you shanked in the dark alleys of the various nations? I'm Mr. Welch and it's time to dress to impress. Starting in publication order, first down the runway is the typical Thaitian man from Karamikos. You'll notice him keeping his hair neat and short with facial hair well trimmed or just clean shaven. There's a tasteful amount of jewelry, but nothing coming close to gaudy. A few rings and possibly a necklace to showcase a degree of wealth. The ensemble outfit will start with basic leather shoes or boots, coupled with trousers, a shirt, and a sleeveless vest. The clothes will be two-tone, as Thaitians prefer simple patterns. Contrast that to the Trolladarn man, who is far more colorful and loud in his choice of apparel. They start with longer hairstyles and fuller beards. For Trolladar and men with longer hair, they will pull it back into a tail. They love jewelry and will wear as many rings and necklaces as they find comfortable. Trolladar and clothing is trousers and a tunic with a scarf used as a belt or a head covering when labor is necessary. Thaitian women wear longer hair, though with the current fashion is to have it braided short or pulled into a bun. Thaitian women share the same attitude towards jewelry as their men, though they will wear a wider variety such as brooches and earrings. Their style of dress is a skirt with a blouse and the same pattern as the men. Thaitian women also prefer a simple color scheme for both casual and formal dress. In comparison, the Trolladarn women will enjoy jewelry of all shapes and sizes, from polished gems to cloisonne. Trolladarn jewelry tends towards larger pieces than other cultures, and it's not uncommon for a Trolladarn woman to wear all of her jewelry if possible. Their hair is long, though it will be pulled back into a ponytail for work. A colored skirt paired with a pullover blouse under a bodice is the standard outfit for daily wear. Sticking with Trolladar and cultural norms, all the clothing will be brightly colored and will often clash. Next down the catwalk is the Yulari, and as a modest people in a harsh environment, they are most reserved in their garments. The basic outfit for the man is simple white pants and a white tabard, with a traditional turban or kafia for protection from the sun. Hair is kept to a moderate length and beards are predominant, but well trimmed. Women prefer a full-length white dress and headdress, normally a shawl or hijab. A Yulari woman will wear her hair long, styled with accessories according to her their station. For the truly wealthy, Yulari will don elaborate and colorful clothing, often robes or jackets made from silk or other fabrics. Women will be clad in saturated color, such as deep reds or blues, along with gold jewelry tailored for the garment. These outfits are rarely worn outside due to the heat, but a private gathering in Yularam can be a sea of colors. The only exception is the color black, which is thought to be a common color associated with bandits and ruffians. Glantry's fashion is all over the place because of the huge variety of cultures found inside their borders. With ten distinct principalities from Alban to New Averon, Glantry celebrates or deplores the fashions of each of its peoples. Albanese men prefer a colored tunic to their waist or knees, either with trousers or leggings depending on the profession of the wearer. Their hair is universally kept short, with facial hair minimal and well trimmed. Albanese women wear an overdress and an underdress, with the underdress being laced up on the sides normally. The underdress is commonly white, though wealthy Albanese women prefer to use more vibrant colors. The underdress is worn with shorter, no sleeves, and is colored to accent the underdress. Their hair is worn long, but kept in buns or braided short. Next, the Belkadiz elves dress in elaborate confections, though the current trend is to wear as much black as possible. Men wear doublets, leggings, or trousers, often with a frilled neck ruff. Belkadiz women wear voluminous dresses with panniers or other frameworks to make the skirts larger. The dresses are also low-cut to increase sensuality. Because all elves in Glantry are nobility, it makes Belkides one of the most well-dressed principalities in the nation. For those that work in the field, garb is rather mundane. A simple shirt and trousers or a plain dress in cotton will do. Berghovians are a strange mix of garish colors and traditional fashion sense. The men sport the neck rough like the Belkides prefer, but instead of all black, they are known for wearing red, orange, and gold cloth with elaborate prints. They share a lot of the Belkides clothing style with doublets and leggings, but also wear their traditional heavy coat with detailed and colorful patterns. The men favor large beards, though they are well trimmed. Women tend to go with bodice and skirt, and while not as exotic as the Belkides in design, they stand out because of the bright tones. Berthoven women wear their hair long, but keep it in buns or similar. The people of Black Hill are an ancient and proud people being of Alphatian stock. The men wear their hair long, pulled back into ponytails. Garb includes trousers and a tunic held up by a belt. The clothing is normally white like their prints, but current fashion has begun to lean towards patterns and pipings in blue, purple, and black to match their skin tones. The women of Black Hill have a long dress under an embroidered tunic and a surcoat that accentuates their hair and other features. They will don varying headdresses including headscarves, hats, and snoods. Jewelry will be tasteful but chosen specifically for each outfit. 
Hair is kept long like the men, but covered in some manner. Moldavians take much of their culture from their original home of Trolodara, including their love of bright colors and jewelry. The major difference is their reliance on heavy coats due to the higher elevation of Glantry. Moldovian nobles are most cosmopolitan, preferring fancy coats and dress shirts. The nobility favors shorter hairstyles and less jewelry, ref reflecting their reserve nature. Moldavian nobles, unlike commoners, eschew facial hair. Glantry in fashion is normally influenced by its prince, but in Corinz, it's mandated by Prince Malapietra. The official fashion for men is the luca, a long colorful robe worn over a tunic and trousers in contrasting colors, most often black. Women wear long dresses with a top heavily embroidered with gold bullion and laced up tightly. Hair is kept short for men with minimal facial hair. Women grow their hair longer, but both sexes tend to cover their hair with some sort of hat or bonnet. The Arawan elves enjoy some of the most fertile lands in Glantry, and their dress benefits from this. The men and women tend to dress similarly, with trousers made from a light fabric that stays warm in the winter. A simple shirt or blouse is worn under a cloak or overcoat, with the fabric dyed a single tasteful color. Hair is worn long and loose, regardless of sex. The region of Klantir is known for its unique fashions brought over from another world, and with good reason. The kilt is the defining piece of clothing, a pleated wool fabric worn like a knee-length skirt. It's primarily worn by the men, but it's not uncommon for women to sport one as well. Hair is generally grown long and loose for men, but styled or braided by women with a variety of hats for both sexes. White shirts or blouses are the norm for upper body clothing, along with a host of accessories like belts or sashes. It's Scotland, people. Picture an extra from Braveheart and you've got Clantier fashion. Krondaharian dress is similar to the Ethan Gar with a few changes, primarily because they left their equestrian lifestyle behind. They still prefer a loose dress made of silk. A short robe called a deal is worn by both men and women, with the length going from the waist to the knees, depending on the owner's preference. Patterns are added if the purchaser can afford one, and a heavy coat is worn in the winter. Hair tends to be worn long, but kept up for both sexes. Jewelry is worn as a symbol of wealth, though not in profusion. The traditional fur-lined conical hat is common among men and women as well. You're looking at Kublai Khan or the Mongolian steppe people here. When it comes to high fashion, nothing even approaches New Averon and their love of fancy clothing. With a massive range in colors and cuts, Averon's style changes almost weekly. Louis XIV, I'm talking to you, sir. Wigs are common because the favored hairstyle can alter after every formal ball. Add in the magic-saturated nature of Glantry, and the fashion designers can change a dress or coat's appearance instantly to create a scene. If you can imagine it, then an Averonian will wear it. Finally, moving on to the fourth nation on this list, after Glantry hogged half the bloody script, let's talk about Irendi. The islanders prefer a simple dress because it's a tropical paradise, meaning it's bloody hot most of the year. Clothes tend to be batik and cotton cloth with long loose robes, with daily wear ranging from the sarongs to the grass skirt. Irendi love colored clothing and jewelry, though handmade jewelry from shells or stone is preferred over precious metals. Hairstyles are entirely personal, with long to short based on preference. Makai men rarely have facial hair by nature, while the Irindi who descended from prisoners will keep beards short and trimmed, mainly because of the heat. The elves of Alfine combine the finest fabrics grown from the forest along with their natural obsession with superiority. Elven clothing is made from a light and durable fabric unavailable outside of Candlebarth. Traditional garments include trousers, tunics, and doublets for men, and long dresses for women. Some elves, especially the Red Arrow tribe, prefer leather clothing as more practical for living in the forest. Hair is almost always worn long, with some styling with the women. Jewelry will be tasteful, and usually often magical in nature. Dwarven clothing is boring. There's a reason why there are no dwarven fashion designers, as there's not much challenge in matching brown with off-brown. Dwarven clothes are practical, with no effort in decoration or flair. They value durability and craftsmanship over aesthetics. However, the dwarves do love jewelry, as they value things that have some permanence and don't wear out. They will wear all sorts of jewelry on their clothes, even braiding it into their beards on formal occasion. Dwarven hair, on average, is medium length, with the men obviously sporting well-trimmed beards of medium to chest length. Women's hair is normally of varying length, but long hair will be braided for ease of care. Dwarves aren't lighting up the catwalks of Averon anytime soon. Dress warmly for the nations of the northern reaches, and get ready to accessorize. The men start off with trousers matched with an undershirt and sheepskin vest. A cloak or heavier coat is added to this in colder months. The clothing will be dyed as a matter of course, with the colors being left purely up to the wearer. The ladies wear a white linen underdress to their ankles with an apron dress, a, a tube-shaped dress with straps that wrap around the body over that. The apron dress will be dyed in a single color to the woman's taste. Hair is worn long for both genders, but the women will pin it up if convenient. The men tend to sport long facial hair, though there is no onus for being clean-shaven. 
Both sexes will decorate their clothes with jewelry and embroidery as much as they can to show off their wealth. The fabric of the Five Shires can be defined in one word, comfortable. Their clothes are made from a variety of fabrics, from light cotton to leather to heavy wool and more exotic materials when available. Men wear tunics and trousers with belts, and women prefer full-length dresses with a bodice or empire waistline. The clothing will be tasteful and never tacky. Jewelry will be kept to a minimum, usually worn on special occasions. Facial hair is rare on him, so the men are clean-shaven as they generally can't grow beards. The men and women of the Shires prefer short hair for comfort. Of course, the hen go barefoot, so if someone has boots on, chances are they're magical. The Five Shires is not a healthy business environment for cobblers. The Minrathad guilds, with their varied population, share the custom of dressing to their wealth. The lesser classes make do with plain trousers or skirts with pullover shirts and blouses and a belt and shoes if they can afford them. For the wealthier men, the style is jeweled or brocaded velvet doublets and hose. Decorative cod pieces are a must. The women sport long, sumptuous gowns with heavy fabric and over gowns of varying quality. Jewelry is ornate and lavish for both sexes. Men tend to wear their hair short and keep any facial hair neatly trimmed. Women keep their hair shoulder length, the mid-back, keeping it undressed unless wearing a hat for an event. Derrickon tries to split the difference between functional and formal. Everyday clothing will be loose in the sleeves but tight around the torso. Men wear a two-tone doublet matched with a flared baggy trousers that become tight at the ankle for boots. Women don a full-length dress, simple in design but heavily layered. All clothing will be dyed with two contrasting colors. Jewelry is kept to a minimum and always done tastefully. Men keep their hair short with minimal facial hair. Women keep their hair medium length and decorate it with innocuous accessories. The Ethengar share their fashion with their Krandaharian cousins. They dress in bright colors with quilted silk jackets with layers to keep them warm on the steps. Both men and women keep their hair long, but the men pride themselves on their mustaches. The ubiquitous part of every Ethengarian's wardrobe is the riding boots, as every one of them is ready to mount a horse at a moment's notice. The Shadow Elves make the dwarves look flamboyant with their minimalist attire. Dyes are almost impossible to acquire underground, so the uniform look is white spider silk cloth. Shadow Elves tend to dress in robes, tied with a cord around the waist and joints to give it some definition. Both sexes wear their hair long, but tie it back for practical reasons. Jewelry is almost unheard of, as the Shadow Elf culture doesn't encourage extravagance. Then we come to the Etrugan, which is split into three different types of dress. First, the Plateau Dwellers wear clothing made entirely of buckskin. Men don shirts and trousers, and the women wear a simple wrap. Hair is kept long for both men and women, but the Elk Clan stands out in their hairstyle. They use animal fat to fix their elaborate arrangements, often trying to outdo each other in complexity. The Turtle Clan has left behind the old ways, even in terms of fashion. They make approximations of their buckskin clothes using the fabrics and materials they've acquired from trading with their neighbors. They will wear all colors, and will often mix cotton, silks, and wools when designing an outfit. The influences of Sind, Irindi, and Derrickin are obvious observing the Turtle Clan. Jewelry is common when not at work, and the more exotic the better. The Turtle Clan prides itself on adopting foreign influences, and even prefers accessories from distant lands as a status symbol. The tribe wears short hair, though there is no stigma for longer hair. The Tiger Tribe has two tiers of fashion, one for the rich and one for everybody else. Slaves are lucky to eat a loincloth. The poor wear cotton wraps that can be used as a robe, serape, dress, or skirt. By law, the clothes must be unadorned, as fancy garb is only for the priests and the more powerful members of the clan. The priests will wear the exact same garb as the peasants, only colorfully dyed in elaborate patterns. Jewelry is restricted only to the higher classes, not that the peasants could afford gold, despite it being quite plentiful in Tigerlands. Hairstyles are dictated by class as well, with peasants required to keep their hair short or even shorn for most men. Women will wear braids, but will often have their heads shaved except for that braid. The Empire of Thyatis contains a plethora of different factions, and despite what a lot of people think, a toga isn't one of them. Normal dress for Thyatian men is a thigh-high short-sleeved tunic with a belt, match it with trousers or hose and soft boots or shoes, and the outfit is complete. It's a versatile garb, and by adjusting how it's worn, one can change the length in a pinch. Women wear an ankle-length sleeveless gown pinned in place with various brooches tied with a belt. Both sexes can adjust this main garment by pulling up or letting out the lower portion. Most garments will be adjusted in length over the year. Thyatians prefer brightly colored clothing, with the more vibrant colors indicating a higher status. For the truly wealthy, elaborate patterns will be created specifically for one garment. Thyatian men prefer short hair, and the few that aren't clean-shaven will have a short beard or mustache. Women prefer their hair long as a symbol of status, but will put it in a ponytail or single braid to make it more manageable. Both sexes love wearing as much jewelry as possible, but only enough to stay comfortable. Fashions of the territories vary greatly, though on formal occasions the Thaitian style prevails. Pearl Islanders prefer a simple kilt, with a band of fabric around the breasts for women. The kilt will be dyed one solid color for decoration. Any jewelry will be made of shells rather than gold. 
this outfit is considered casual wear, and they will dress in traditional formal wear when necessary. Because of the Ochelian disdain for individuality, both men and women share the same style of clothing. A straight, full-length collared tunic is good enough for everyone in Ochelia. The robe is buttoned at the front, and there is no belt. Ochelians wear their hair long, often in a single braid. Ochelian men share the homeland's aversion to facial hair. Hinterlanders wear a style of clothing that reflects their position in their ancestry. Men wear a tunic with a knotwork embroidery depicting their clan and rank. They pair this with trousers and soft boots and tie the outfit together with a large belt. It's not uncommon for hinterlander men to go bare-chested in day-to-day -day life. Hinterlander women wear a short or long-sleeved tunic that reaches their knees, again with embroidery proclaiming their clan and heritage. They round it out with trousers and soft boots with a small belt. Hinterlander men wear their hair long and sport large mustaches, if not paired with a beard. The women keep their hair long in double braids. Alphacian dress, like Alphacian society, is split between nobles and commoners. Nobles wear elaborate robes made out of spider silk and then decorate the robes with complex patterns and even magical illusions to stand out. This robe, called a kahara, is only allowed to be worn by nobility. A commoner found wearing one is reduced to slavery. The nobles try to outdo each other with these decorations and the best spider silk tailors can become quite wealthy. For the commoners, there's a difference between those that have money and the peasants. The merchant class will try to copy the style and appearance of the kahara, though forced to use the inferior cotton. Even though they aren't nobles, they will carry themselves around as one compared to the poor commoners. Commoners wear knee-length tunics and a trouser with soft boots, but have to make do with a single color because of their status. For hairstyles, it's the longer the better in Alphacia. Hair is rarely worn straight, instead it's curled or styled with colorful ribbons or braids. Okay, that's the fashion show of Mastara, featuring 16 nations, and Glantry was half of them. This is pure fluff, there's no rules for the different styles of dress, but when your DM asks what people look like, now they have an idea of how everyone is dressed. Remember, this doesn't apply to beggars and such, and the party is under no requirement to dress like the rest of society. Just like the rebels they are. Next week, we're looking at another beefy subject, the children of Mastara, or what to expect when you are but a wee one. But until next time, remember, it's better to look good than feel good.